Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which time zone you're coming from. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Haddad. Um, I work at the Linux Foundation, and I have a couple roles, um, mostly focusing on AI and data, open source AI and data, but also given my experience in uh, open source building and, and um, growing open source program offices, I also help a lot of companies uh, in the Linux Foundation build and, and grow and um, establish their open source uh, program offices. So um, about maybe a month ago, I was told that, hey, there's uh, this empty room that we have available. Do you want to do something with it? And I'm like, yeah, let's do an open source uh, program office talk. So thank you for joining today. Um, so you, uh, it's a large deck, um, so uh, I will not be going in deep in every slide unless somebody has any questions on it. So I'll try to kind of keep up a certain pace. Uh, and I'm also happy to share the whole deck. There's like maybe 80 slides. So if anyone wants to have access um, to the slides, uh, please reach out to me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, whatever. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share it. And everybody is free to reuse without any mention. So you feel free to reuse as you wish. Um, so the um, my experience with OSPO started with Ericsson uh, over 20 years ago, actually. And uh, it's a very interesting story because even in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, there were open source program offices, but they were not called that. So the lab I was in was called Open Systems Lab. And our goal was to find uh, and basically curate open source technologies that we can use in our telecom infrastructure and um, you know, telecom servers. And we were doing exactly what OSPOS do today. So over time, you know, IBM in the early 2000s uh, established their Linux Technology Center. Uh, Intel in 2002 established their um, uh, OSTG, Open Source Technology Group, right? So, and eventually over the years, uh, maybe for the past six, seven years, we've kind of standardized on the terminology of OSPOS. Uh, so today's session covers really a lot of topics. Um, uh, I have the abstract there, but I'm, you know, certainly I'm not going to read it. But basically, um, you know, how critical open source has become uh, to how we build software today. Um, and there's actually a lot of what I think of as like cool graphics that I have in there. Uh, all of these are actually imported from Linux Foundation research papers. So all of the graphics, if you wish to reuse them, you can just go to Linux research website. Uh, we've, we've published a lot of OSPO papers. You can just download the infographics and use them. They're publicly available for free to use. Um, introduction to OSPOs, um, the OSPO transformation, which is something very interesting that I've experienced over the years where I worked in organizations where we started as a small group of people. Uh, for instance, at Samsung, I was the first hire to establish that group. And then over the years, my team became a little over 100 people. And now they're kind of shrinking down, right? Uh, so we we'll talk a little bit about this transformation. Uh, there's no one format. It's every company has their own, uh, whatever works for them. And over time, things change and OSPOs adapt, right? Uh, talk about staffing, minimum staffing to run an OSPO, roles and responsibility, what this office do, what the people do as kind of uh, minimum core viable operation, uh, challenges and some practices. Um, so there's really quite a bit of information um, and certainly everybody is um, free to grab a copy of this and to use them. Uh, so criticality of open source, uh, as you know today, open source is everywhere. I mean, just the fact that you probably took a car, flew here, used your bank, used the internet, everything in our modern infrastructure uh, relies on open source. So when a company is doing uh, software or they're building hardware that utilizes uh, certain pieces of software, you're actually in the open source business even if you don't realize it or you're users of open source uh, even without uh, realizing it. So there are certainly a lot of advantages um, that uh, entices organizations to um, curate and, and use and deploy open source code, but also to get to a point where they want to contribute to these components and use them in their products and services and grow these communities and support them to make sure that innovation continues to happen in project communities that you depend on for your products and services. So really uh, a lot of advantages. I will not go through them. It's just a kind of quick introduction into open source. Uh, and there are really some very specific impact that open source has on any given organization. Uh, so it certainly accelerated the development of open solutions. 
um, provides implementation to open standards. Uh, a lot of the reference implementations today um, in open standards are actually based on um, or licensed under an open source license, so they're kind of open source software. Uh, it helps you commoditize the market, uh, reduce kind of the price of strategic assets. Uh, you know, a, a, in a lot of times, companies use open source as um, to, to their advantage in, in different um, uh, business situations. Uh, so certainly there are some technical advantages, but there is also a business advantage to it where open source is just another tool in your toolbox as an organization that you can deploy and use uh, in specific situations. Um, and certainly it's a great way to partner with other organizations, with project communities, individuals, uh, collaborate with them on bringing uh, new development and um, new innovation into whatever project that you're considering. So um, this slide actually goes back maybe 10 years ago when I uh, started at Samsung talking about uh, how open source enables our uh, projects. Uh, and I, I actually, um, uh, you know, once in a while I will tell kind of funny anecdotes. So one of the instances um, in relation to this slide is, you know, as head of OSPO, I have to raise funds for my team every year. Uh, and it's like in, in the millions of dollars. So uh, one of the things I've done at Samsung is I showed up to, to fundraising in, um, in Seoul in South Korea and uh, I'm meeting multiple executives, everybody's in the room. Uh, very few of them really knew anything about open source. And I'm there to raise maybe over $25 million for my group. And I had a slide that had about 30 product pictures of products of Samsung. Everything you can think of that pro Samsung produces, you know, choose the top 30 products. I have them on the slide. And actually, um, it's a very small team, a group of executives, maybe, uh, you know, 10 to 12 people and their handlers sitting kind of on the back seats. And I asked the question, you know, how many of these products do you think runs open source? Right, or utilizes Linux and open source. And certainly because they're super senior, like you know, EVPs and SVPs, it took like you know, a few seconds to get them to kind of relax a little bit and start kind of socializing on, on this question. And you know, some of them like you know, five, six, one of them said nine. Um, and the actual true answer is all of them. Okay, so when you look at a portfolio of a company where every single core product that you sell relies on open source, you need to have an open source strategy, you need to build up your competency because you don't want to be in a position where innovation and development is driven by other companies and most of them are actually your competitors. So you want to align your products with what's happening in open development to make sure there's good synchronicity across um, these efforts. Uh, so there's a lot of enablement that happens uh, with open source. Some of it is I call like direct enablement, meaning something you do and you have immediate results to it. And some of it is indirect enablement where you do an action, there's a direct result to it, but over time there's some indirect uh, advantages that happen that accumulate. Uh, and really the result of all of these different enablement is you know, better products, better services that you're building, a better relationship with your uh, project communities that you depend on, and also in some cases, depending on what you're doing, better relationship with your customers as well, especially when they have access to the code bases that they use in deployments. Um, so um, some of the slides I have now, and this is, I mentioned earlier, is kind of infographics from um, different reports that the Linux Foundation has built over time. So if you go to the Linux Foundation uh, research website, you'll be able to download all of these. Uh, so every single year, um, the Linux Foundation, in collaboration with the um, uh, To Do Group, they um, survey uh, organizations about their open source deployments and their OSPO groups. Um, and um, year over year, uh, we compare these results and we try to figure out trends and what's going on across the ecosystem. So um, a lot of these results, as you see, are actually from these surveys. And uh, one of the very important um, trends that we notice is that uh, once organizations start formalizing and adopting kind of a, a, an official OSPO group and they're able to hire better people, they're able to attract uh, more talent and you know, higher quality talent uh, into their organization. Uh, and I actually experienced this first hand when I joined Samsung in uh, 2013. So Samsung is not known to be a software company. 
uh, it's not known to be good in open source. It was like really a, uh, a very difficult situation. And it was very hard to hire for, a, for the first 12 to 18 months. And two years into it, I actually shut down my LinkedIn messages because all I got are messages from uh, developers, hey, do you have any openings in your group, right? And we were able to grow that team from like 12 people that we hired the first year to six years later, we were a little over 100. Um, and a lot of them are maintainers and committers in different key projects that we use. So the fact that we established the group, we had kind of formal presence, we had our own budget, we have different um, advantages like work from home, choose your own equipment, you know, etc. These different perks, we were able to build up that credibility that developers, you know, in, in the general realize that, hey, you know, this company is kind of serious, otherwise they wouldn't do all these different um, um, uh, efforts they're doing, and then it, we become kind of a target for individuals that want to join um, uh, the effort. So it's really uh, great and improving uh, not just the product, but the ability to attract um, talent. Uh, and in general, when you look at open source, it's just another tool. So organizations typically they you know they have their own internal R and D. They have a relationship with or investments in different startup organizations. They work with universities. Uh, so there's really multiple venues for innovation and open source is just one of them. Um, and when organizations start thinking of open source as such, as it's just another building block in their innovation pipeline, uh, it becomes a lot easier to work with and figure out, yeah, this is really strategic to us, as strategic as investing in startups, as strategic as building university relationship uh, and launching projects with universities. And with that, most of the companies when they look at their open source journey, and this is kind of um, the, the scale I use, um, all companies start as a consumer. They start, you know, we're using components of, or, or different libraries, frameworks, tools, uh, you know, operating system, you name it. And over time, um, they get to the realization that, you know, this is really good. We're, we're able to benefit from that use and we want to increase our commitment to the project and increase our influence uh, in the development and the road mapping of the project. So they, they start increasing their uh, participation and then they become kind of influential contributors. And um, some companies go further to aim for leadership position in these different projects. Uh, and certainly this is on a project by project basis, meaning you know, if you're a participant and a, you know, um, you have contributors into the Linux kernel that are, um, you know, maintainer of different subsystem, that doesn't translate into any other project. So, uh, typically, what we used to do at many of the companies uh, I worked at, and it's a kind of an ongoing practice, is companies survey their open source bill of material. You know, what are the top, let's say, you know, 50 open source projects we're using across all these different products and services and create a certain prioritization scheme because that will guide how the internal open source effort will be uh, put towards which projects and then focus on kind of the key critical uh, projects. And every year this changes. So um, throughout my experience, we go through that uh, exercise every year because every year there's new things happening, there's new products, there's products that we're retiring and, and so on. So every year we survey our products and we try to understand where we're using open source, in what capacity, what are the particular components and where should we put our resources? Because you know, when you look at any, any product, any given company produces, sometimes it's over a thousand open source uh, components, libraries or tools that are in that uh, product, over a thousand. Right? So you cannot have uh, involvement on all of them. So you need to prioritize the, kind of the top 20, 30 where they're critical to you. You cannot replace them. You cannot recreate them. You cannot outsource them. So kind of a certain criteria around them and then focus on these. And a lot of companies, you know, they're super happy being just a consumer. Uh, other companies push a little bit to become a little bit of a participant. Others want to be a contributor. So it's on a project by project basis where on a given project you just consume. It's not, it's not a critical project. You don't care what happens there. It's just like a piece that you can swap in and out as you need. And as the uh, importance of the component becomes higher, then you want to be involved in the project. Um, so as part of all of that exercise, organizations create uh, an open source strategy. Um, and uh, there, there are actually some pretty good 
uh, open documentation on creating open source strategy and even some organizations made available their internal strategy document online. So you can actually go search for that on uh, Google, for example, and um, download them and figure out, you know, how company X, Y, and Z, you know, are, are building their open source uh, strategy and kind of learn from them and adapt that as a template for your own. And, you know, when we examine all of them, there are usually kind of four key tenants to that strategy. Uh, the first one is kind of a focus on the project, you know, which project and what criteria we, they use to, to decide what projects to get involved in. Second one is the actual community, you know, how to build up a good relationship with the community um, and, and create that uh, positive understanding between the community and, and the organization. Uh, a certain governance aspect to how open source is being governed within that specific company. For example, uh, if we want to use open source component, what's the process, what's the policy, if we want to contribute to you. So that kind of internal governance. And then there's the general culture, building the culture. And this is actually very important. And it relates to so many facets of open source across all different organizations. So I will give you an example on the culture. So um, I worked with very old companies that are over 100 years old and I worked for companies that were you know five six years old and what's really interesting is uh, with a company that was established when open source was already mature and available and everybody knows it everybody is kind of an open source developer so if you think of for example Facebook or Meta you now their open source office is probably like five people that's it why because the company was founded on the principle of we want to use as much open source as possible, right? Uh, so they started with, you know, they didn't go and outsource, um, you know, uh, their hardware to Sun Microsystems or use whatever operating system. They, they started with Linux, Apache, MySQL, and, you know, Python and so on. Uh, if you go to an older company, uh, like, for example, when I used to work at Motorola, um, you know, it was very hard to get started. Uh, so a lot of the newer company already started with open source. Everybody understands it. A lot of the developers are hired. They have experience with open source. Uh, so there is not much of a cultural clash. Uh, if you look, even it's uh, on geographical basis. So I worked for companies in Asia uh, where it's kind of very hierarchical um, uh, order. You know, th there's the boss who gives the order to the person and, and then you end up with like, I got to go do this, although I'm not convinced with it. Whereas in like European or US companies, it's more fluid and you're able to, uh, as a developer, kind of transmit what's going on and, and get a feel and, and have better fluidity in what you're doing. Uh, so these kind of are uh, the major four tenets of uh, an open source strategy. And uh, they typically evolve around products or services in, in, in this case. So how can we work with open source uh, across projects, different communities, how can we structure ourselves internally in terms of governance and build up a, a positive open source culture in the serving of our products and services. Um, so you will see this kind of reoccurring um, and there are basically four core uh, aspects to, uh, um, to the work of OSPOS in general and I'll get to that in a little bit later on. Uh, so the first one, the first aspect is uh, consuming open source. So companies need to consume open source. They adopt open source uh, projects. They use them in their products uh, or their online services. And as part of that, they have to comply with the open source licenses, right? So then there's the second piece of compliance. All right, so now we've used, um, you know, 20, 30, few dozens, hundreds of open source components. Now we need to understand how we're using them, under which licenses they're coming to us so that we can go and fulfill the license obligations and kind of respect these different licenses. Um, and then one aspect above that is uh, where company sometimes go in, into the contribution territory, which is, okay, now we're using and we're complying with the licenses. We will start uh, contributing to key of, uh, projects that, um, that are important to us. So now you need a different set of infrastructure and enabling elements in your company. For example, you need uh, uh, a process to internally to, to manage that uh, contribution aspect. Uh, you need to have a policy. So think, for example, in a company like Google or Meta or even Samsung, uh, where we had um, in, in Korea alone over 50,000 developers waking up every morning and using open source. So in a small company, you're able to manage that People sit in a small startup, everybody sits in a room like this, they know each other, they talk, you know, things get 
done quickly. But in a company where you have thousands of developers, you need to have this massive uh, infrastructure to know what's going on, to, to know that we're using these components, we're approving the use of these different components, we're, we're not going to have a license or compliance hiccups. You know? So there's really uh, a lot of challenges when, when you think of um, uh, the infrastructure required internally um, in terms, uh, at a large scale. Uh, and this is actually one of the challenges I will talk um, later on. So this, this is kind of um, um, you know, a crash course uh, introduction kind of to break the ice. Uh, I'm I would like to stop for a minute, uh, see if you have any questions before we kind of delve into OSPOs. And please feel free as I proceed, you, know, you can just raise your hand and uh, I would stop and take in any questions as we go. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. I thought you raised your hand. Go ahead. Is, is there a mic? Um, thank you. Well, it's, it's fine. We're, it's, we'll take one minute break and then... Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I will lose my voice by the end of, of the session. I have a question um, regarding when the company is um, do not have a if changes something in these strategies in the way we perceive how we are doing the strategies when the product of the company itself is not open source or when we're just using consuming but also releasing an open source product itself yeah very good question so um, I will just rephrase kind of for the benefit of everyone so the question is how or if there is an impact on your open source strategy if what you're using is not necessarily open source. So you're, you're, you have your internal activities, you're deploying open source, right? So that's, so uh, it certainly differs. Um, and uh, one of the main areas um, where we have, as an organization, paid in the past, because not in the Linux Foundation role, like previous roles, paid extra attention is how these uh, open source components we're bringing in, uh, how they would interact with internal proprietary uh, uh, components from a licensing and, and compliance perspective. Because uh, in, in many cases, uh, and I'm going to use a very simple example, okay? Uh, let's say we're, um, we're, we're compiling an internal proprietary piece of code and it relies on uh, let's say an LGPL license component. So we want to make sure, for example, that uh, the linking is dynamic, for example, that it's not static. Uh, because if it is static, then we're generating a binary that contains code from both. And as a result of that, we have to make our proprietary piece available as open source. Uh, so certainly there is uh, a difference, uh, mostly from, uh, not at a strategic level, it's mostly at a tactical level, meaning uh, we will still care and the same interest in bringing open source component, encouraging reuse of technologies, uh, encouraging minimizing time to market from the fact that we're picking up things that already exist. We don't want to re recreate the, the, the wheels. Uh, but where the difference is, is uh, there's additional attention on how these components we bring in interact with a proprietary component. Because if it's still open, if all these components are open source, you don't care because they're all open and you're gonna make them available. But what you wanna do is keep a piece proprietary and that's where the interaction happens. So there's a lot of attention paid at uh, the architectural level of kind of isolating that uh, proprietary value away from anything that could trigger a distribution uh, that will force you to put up your proprietary stuff under an open source license. But outside of that, business as usual. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, this is one of the most difficult aspects uh, because to, to be able to do that, we typically call it architectural review. We do reviews with engineers and these can be like two hours long. And sometimes there are some really complex system and there's like five, six, 10 engineers in the room and we're trying to identify how things move around, the interfaces, you know, system calls, et cetera, just to, to make sure there's no inference between the proprietary bits and the open source bits. Uh, so introduction to OSPOs. So what is an OSPO? So everybody has their own definitions. Uh, from my perspective, having been involved in program offices, I set up a few of them, I managed a couple. Um, 
OSPO is just a program office that manages all companies' interactions with open source. You know, that includes using open source, contributing, compliance, community events, open source foundations, open standards, anything that touches open source is has to go through that office, which is like the orchestrator of all these events and activities across the whole company. So anything open source has to go through that office, pretty much like the uh, central um, uh, operation of open source within any given uh, organization. Um, so they manage open source across uh, the whole organization, as I mentioned, across you know everything that that happens within that given uh, organizations. Uh, so why should you set up an open source office? Um, I may be preaching to the, you know, you probably already have open source offices, but basically uh, it, it becomes extremely hard to track all the different activities across com the company. So similarly to how you have a program office for a given product or program office for a given activity, uh, open source is as important and it deserves uh, the attention to, uh, to be able to track all these different activities. So can you think, for example, of um, a large company like Microsoft or Intel or IBM not having an office like that. I mean, it would be, there would be so many redundant efforts. Uh, even there would be some conflicting efforts, right? So the, the importance of that office is kind of streamlining uh, open source activities throughout, across all companies, especially when uh, a company has multiple business divisions, right? So, you, so you, I worked in an organization where you have like the infrastructure division, uh, the mobile division, the home appliances division, the TV division, and so on. So there has to be kind of a sync on uh, policies and, and strategy across all of these dif different divisions, and OSPOS does that. Uh, so they're growing. Um, this is uh, from the 2022 survey. Actually, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, they announced their 2023 survey results. So this is kind of old. Uh, there's a newer version of the uh, survey that was announced, so you can go to the uh, uh, to-do group GitHub org, and they actually have the uh, new results published there. Uh, but basically, it's a continuous growth year over year since we started doing the survey in 2018. So in 2019, we had uh, more organizations establishing OSPO than 2018, and then in 2020, more organizations establishing OSPO than 2019, uh, and so on. And now it's actually kind of a, uh, an exception for a company not to have an OSPO. It's kind of a default, hey, you know, uh, something is off if, if you don't have one already. Um, so where, where do companies start? Uh, I think I spoke to a, a different uh, version of the slide where companies start as users, they become participant, and uh, they drive uh, for um, uh, leadership. Uh, so. Um, one of the important thing is, okay, we talked about setting up internal infrastructure to support the efforts uh, of open source. Um, so um, in this slide, you see the different elements uh, ideally an organization need to have to support the efforts of consuming open source and complying with the licenses. Uh, and typically, I actually consult with a lot of companies, and the first reaction is when they see the slides, like, oh my God, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> right? Uh, do we really need to do all of that? Um, and, you know, trust me, I, you know, I've been doing this stuff for a really long time, and you only need, like, a few of these boxes to get started. And you don't get to build an infrastructure that encompasses all of these in, in a year or two. It takes a few years, and I, it's a great goal to, to aim for. Hello? Did I lose the audio? Um, are you able to hear me? Okay. Um, so, um, so it's a lot of items, uh, but basically um, in any given company I've worked at, and, and this is kind of my, my, everything you see here is kind of my personal production, meaning you know, all the content I created personally over the years to get to a point where we have this, right? So, um, so I, I was looking at all the different experiences at Ericsson, at Motorola, at, um, Palm, HP, Samsung, and different consulting I've done to organization, and I built up, uh, uh, you know, these different um, kind of templates. Uh, so basically, when when you're starting in any, any given company, you want to use open source, so you need a certain way, a policy to govern the use. You need a process to implement the use, right? Uh, you need to think of strategy. You know, how we're going to implement compliance. 
Uh, I'm going to start from the left side. Okay. So under strategy, you know, how are we going to implement uh, open source license compliance? So certainly, we don't want to be in the news as a company that is uh, uh, having or being challenged in terms of uh, their license compliance. Uh, how do we manage inquiries coming to, to our desk in terms of um, uh, license compliance? Uh, what is our um, risk tolerance? Um, so, for example, I worked for a company, a startup, that had one product, and that product used about 80% open source code. So our risk tolerance was zero. We have zero tolerance to any error. So we have to be 100% on top of everything. But when you're a company that ships hundreds uh, of millions of devices every single year, you, you, know, you have more tolerance to errors than the small startup that relies on a single product. Uh, and that affects you know, how you build up your uh, policy and how you execute them. Uh, what's your M&A uh, strategy with respect to open source? You know, do you do due diligence? How? Why? When? You know, all these different things. And then when software gets into your um, company via procurement, whether it's uh, consultant, contractors, uh, you buy software or whatever the case is, any type of software coming into your organization that is not created directly by your engineer, how do you handle um, uh, compliance for that, right? So there's, there's this aspect. Uh, so there's, there are a lot of different components. And similarly to that, there are many other components uh, in terms of communication, policy and processes to, uh, to audit the, the code, uh, to distribute the code, uh, to the actual development. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, and typically what I, t what I tell organization is, okay, the most important pieces to start with is set up a, a company policy, and usually it should be like very short, everybody should understand it, you'd be able to write it in like a single paragraph. And I've worked in companies where we had policies that were like 37, 40, 50 pages long, nobody read, nobody you know, really understood, and it was like a lot of chaos. Uh, so, so I think my, my best advice on this is if you're in like in an elevator and you need to give somebody a 30 second elevator pitch on your open source policy, you should be able to do it in 30 seconds. Otherwise, it's not a good policy. Right? Uh, so there are different uh, components. So the policy and the process and educating your employees on what to do when they want to use open source and how to comply. And I think these are kind of essential. And from there, you start building these boxes. So when I was, and I tell a lot about Samsung because it's like my most recent experience, uh, just before joining the LF. Uh, I started with like a couple components and it took me like five, six years later to implement everything that is here and on the following slides. Uh, so it's kind of incremental. And if you survey a lot of the companies, uh, one of the services I offer to, to companies is I survey what they have and I kind of compare to industry best practices and recommend you know, improvements. And this is kind of the template we use for such uh, practices. And I would really recommend you, you use that as a tool uh, you can go back to your organization and say, okay, let's print this and put a checkbox across all these different things that we already have and figure out what we're missing. And this will give you kind of uh, a practical way to figure out uh, where improvements can be introduced. This is not going to work for another hour to do that. So. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, in terms of compliance, uh, I, I kind of inject a few things here and there. Um, uh, there are a lot of challenges today. Uh, so, it's, the compliance space uh, today is very different than you know, 20 years ago. Uh, I remember my, my first report um, in 2020 was, uh, in, in 2000, 2020, in year 2000 was like, what is the GPL and what is Linux? So, uh, we, we're past that, right? So we understand the GPL, we understand the licenses, we understand what we need to do to, to comply with the licenses. And I think now the challenges are uh, different type of challenges in terms of compliance, you know, uh, ch uh, challenges with respect to scale. You know, we're not using dozens of components. In some cases, there are products that use 800, 900, and sometimes over a thousand open source uh, library and, and, and tool. So how are we able to uh, track all of these components and comply with the licenses at such a large scale. And this is just one product. And if you're a company that ships dozens and, and a lot of type of products, then that scale is multiplied. Um, transparency, uh, speed, right? Speed is extremely important because we want to be able to keep up with the development internally. So if you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of de developers that wake up every day, download open source code, 
integrate it, compile it, and build it, you need to be able to keep up with all of that from a compliance perspective. So uh, compliance, uh, this, the speed of ensuring compliance is actually very important, and certainly accuracy. You know, uh, you can do a very fast job on all the code, and it's a super sloppy. So the goal is to do a really good job on all the software incoming and to, to be very accurate. Uh, so these are kind of the common challenges you will face. Um, I actually have um, um, the Linux Foundation published a few, few e-books on license compliance to help organizations uh, implement compliance programs. So you, you're, you're very welcome to download these. They're like 50, 70 pages detailed. Uh, manuals on how to build up uh, efficient compliance infrastructures. Uh, so I will skip kind of uh, rules for developers. Uh, these are kind of my top 12 rules. I would encourage you to take them and adopt them if, if you find them useful. Uh, communicate them to your engineers like, you know, here are things that you should do or shouldn't do when you're working with open source um, um, uh, uh, software to, to, to avoid any kind of comp compliance um, issues. Um, I see people taking pictures, so that's why. <laughs> All right. Uh, I messed up slide. Uh, so <laughs> contributing to open source. Uh, uh, so this is kind of continuing with the theme of, OK, first we use open source. We need to build up that massive blinding infrastructure to capture everything. And now moving to contributing to open source, we have another set of infrastructure that we need to have in place uh, as well. Um, so I will start from the very simple things, right? Uh, you don't want your developers to go and, and download whatever they want and contribute to this project without kind of different checkpoints. So uh, companies typically have policies that manage the contribution aspect. They have a process to implement the policy and automate it. So, you know, things are not done over email and, and kind of in a way that is hard to track. Um, so you have a process and a policy. Uh, companies offer guidelines to their engineers what to do, what not to do when contributing to open source uh, projects. Uh, and typically, when you're at that stage, you have a certain level of prioritization uh, and aligning your developers' interests with your company interests. A lot of times, developers uh, may be interested in contributing to projects that, you, you know, as an organization, you really don't care about. So you want to make sure that uh, any type of contribution um, towards a, a given effort you have internally is, um, is approved and is, is managed in a proper way. Uh, and this is where, in many instances, organizations start to have a dedicated group um, that they call OSPO, uh, because then they're branching out. It's not, we're not just using and complying, but now, okay, we want to contribute to project. We want to figure out where to put our efforts. We want to figure out what open source foundation we should work with, because a lot of the projects are hosted in foundations, whether it's the LF or any of its umbrella foundations or the Apache Foundation, Eclipse, Mozilla, uh, and, and others. Uh, and then typically at that stage, there is also an interest in getting involved um, in open standards and in providing reference implementations. So you can see things are kind of branching out and becoming a little bit out of control because the number of efforts and the number of um, areas where you can work in becomes so much more. And then, um, oops, sorry, uh, another messed up slide. I think this is the translation from like Google to PDF or something like that. Um, you know, how can you make all of this work, right? Uh, so. Um, you need to create the right environment. Uh, and this kind of ties to the culture point we discussed earlier. Um, so uh, a very good example of that is, you know, I joined one of the companies uh, to lead their open source effort. And, um, you know, I was assigned a Windows laptop. Um, I said, okay, um, I took in and I threw Linux on it. And then I couldn't fetch email because there was no support for IMAP on their email servers. Uh, and then the VPN wouldn't allow me to access uh, the network from home because there was no VPN support for Linux. Uh, and then I couldn't work from home. I had to be in the office because of how the network worked. Um, th there were so many complications, right? So when you put very motivated individuals who are highly skilled, like say in, in any given open source domain, in such an environment, they cannot succeed. So you need to, to have all the right environment for them uh, to succeed uh, and provide the right incentives. Uh, and, and the right exposure. So by exposure, I mean is like we need to allow our developers to attend events like this. 
to socialize with their peers, to meet face to face, to present their work, get feedback on it. So this is kind of the type of um, what I mean by the right exposure and give them the right incentives. Um, and I have actually a pretty funny story. Uh, it's actually a true story and I agonized with it for about a year until I was able to resolve it. But basically uh, in one of the organizations where I work as head of open source, one, one of the you know, engineers or developers, they have a uh, um, you know, performance bonus. And every, at the end of the year, they get paid the bonus based on certain metrics. And one of the metrics was a line of code uh, injected or accepted in upstream. So, yeah. And that created so many problems because it is absolutely the wrong metric to have. Um, because you're pri prioritizing volume over functionality and, and quality. And that created the second problem where a lot of the engineers were dumping useless code because it was a lot of lines because they're aiming for bigger bonus and developers, maintainers in the project rejecting all of these. And then to a point where in some of the projects we were participating in, um, they stopped taking in, they pretty much blocked our domain name. Uh, and it took us really a few months to recover from that. So providing the right incentive is, is actually very important because it drives the behavior, the right behavior. Uh, so th this is actually a true story. Um, um, so um, I will skip this benefits of upstream code. We all know that it's actually very important to upstream code. You, you, you want to minimize your internal technical debt. You don't want to maintain different forks um, and so on. Uh, so uh, this chart, actually, I, I, I like this, uh, not for the fact that I actually created it, but it's actually visually, it explains the importance of working with upstream. Uh, and I actually use this a lot, uh, these couple of slides, this one and the one after with executives who don't necessarily have experience in software or experience with open source. Um, and to address, you know, why we should be involved in upstream code, right? So typically, um, if you're not upstreaming code, you're like pulling code from a given open source project, you apply your customization to it, you add functionality, you add, um, you fix bugs, fix code, whatever the case is, and then you merge it with the product tree. And then you don't upstream it, right? It stays internal. And then the next time there's a new upstream version, you have to repeat that and do it again for any new uh, functionality you're adding. So it's creating a lot of internal code that needs to be maintained. Uh, and actually, in, in one of the organizations um, I worked at, there was one graphic library where our internal fork had over 200,000 line of code that was a, the delta with the mainstream. And we had two engineers full time uh, working to uh, maintain that. Uh, it's the EFL libraries. I don't know if anyone knows the EFL. Um, so true story, right? So it's, it was costing the company two senior engineers full time <laughs> just to maintain the fork of one single library. Uh, so um, the other model, which is upstreaming way, is you, know, you download things from um, upstream from the open source project, you apply your changes to it, and you push it back. And you work to integrate that with the project so that the next time you go and download the upstream version, your functionality is already there. So you don't need to maintain that. So ideally, you want to have zero technical debt. It's almost impossible to be at zero, but you want to be as light as possible. And this is really the core um, reason, the one, if I have to say one reason on why a company should work directly with upstream, it's for that reason. And, um, you know, for that library, I mentioned the EFL with 200,000 line of code, even after like four or five years working on this, we still couldn't manage to, um, to, to push it because it was just like, as we call it, spaghetti code. That's, we had to rework everything. It was like a nightmare that we have to live uh, with forever, pretty much. Um, and because typically things start small, right? Okay, we're just going to carry this code. And then over time, it builds up and builds up and it becomes unmanageable and becomes uh, it reaches a certain point where it's unacceptable to push that code upstream. You, you know, they're going to kick you out. Uh, so another uh, kind of survey information, you know, 65% organiza of the organization contribute uh, to upstream, and this is actually going up year over year. And I believe the 2023 uh, survey that was published a couple of days ago actually has uh, better numbers than this. Um, so if you're um, building internal um, presentations to kind of convince your management on 
why you should you know, participate more in upstream development code, you can certainly go back to the OSPO survey, pull up the results, showcase what's going on in the industry, because they also have a breakdown of uh, specific industries. You know, they look at telecom industry, they look at finance, at automotive. So if you're, for example, in the finance industry, you can exactly know, you know, how, what's the percentage of companies in the finance sector have an OSPO? How's that changing year over year? So you'll be able to get industry specific uh, information as part of your uh, supporting documentation. Uh, so becoming a leader in open source project, uh, this is actually very easy in, in a sense at the conceptual level. Okay, um, uh, you know, you need to contribute and be visible in the project, drive code and have kind of consistent presence in the project. You know, uh, now take that and translate it to an engineering or to uh, a business leader in any given organization. For them, they're not thinking that. They're thinking, oh, I need to go hire so many people. Uh, I need to get involved and sponsor open source events. I need to be a member of the foundation, right? So we need to always create that correlation between, uh, you know, actions and how that affects our internal efforts. Um, and actually, um, uh, very, I, and I try always to uh, kind of inject stories here and there just kind of to keep it uh, a, as interesting as possible. Uh, so in the, in the early 2000s, and I'm taking you back like 24 years, um, I was working at Ericsson Research and we, we just started the process of um, evaluating the Linux kernel and kind of testing with it a little bit to replace our internal uh, uh, operating system, which back then was called uh, Telorp. T-E-L-O-R-B. And uh, back then, the maintainer of the Linux kernel, today the maintainer is Greg Crow Hartman as the kind of lead maintainer. There's all, certainly Linux Torvalds, uh, less active on a day-to-day -day basis, but Greg Crow Hartman, right? But in, 20, in year 2000, it was a high school student who's 17 years old, living in Brazil, who was the maintainer of the kernel. So I, at that time, I was a senior researcher at Ericsson in, in Montreal, and I'm talking with my boss, who's the director of research, trying to explain to him that we submitted the patches and we're working with the maintainer, and they couldn't grasp that. And then he was asking me, what, what is a maintainer? Who is this guy? And so on. And it was so hard to exp for him to understand that it's a 17-year-old kid in Brasilia, somewhere in the jungle. <laughs> you know, who is actually holding up this massive company called Ericsson. And remember, like, Ericsson in 2000, it was Ericsson, Cisco, Alka. These companies were the Facebook of today and the Microsoft. I mean, these were, like, the top tech companies. Um, so uh, it's actually a very humbling experience because, you know, these companies come in, you know, we are Ericsson, we're Nokia, we're Alcatel, we're this, we're that, right? And then, okay, now you're penning this 17-year-old kid somewhere on, like, a 286 computer waiting to you know, test your uh, code. Um, so it's actually um, very interesting, but basically it's engagement with foundation, engagement with project, and following project processes and whatnot. And, you know, on all of these different topics that I touched on today, we have really a library, a large library of publications that are very practical that you can tap into uh, on any of these resources and make available to your colleagues and kind of learn from, because a lot of these this content is real life experiences that we pulled in from working with hundreds of companies at the Linux Foundation and we put together in, in a very practical way. Um, so, um, so we talked um, earlier about you know, the, the, the consumer, participant, and, and contributor, and, and dealer, and uh, certainly they, they overlap. You, you cannot over day, you know, overnight jump from being in one phase as a company to jumping into the second phase. So you can see I tried to, what I tried to do with this graphic is to show that they overlap, uh, and they're project dependent, right? So you may be just a, a user of uh, Zlib library, but also you're a user of the kernel and a little, you participate in the discussion on the mailing list and so on, but also you're a contributor to Node.js or other things. So they overlap and it's dependent uh, on a project by project basis. Uh, and, and this is um, a cool graphics to, to work from when you're working in an organization because um, some organizations are very rigid and it's very hard to kind of get funding to get things you know, for the different efforts you want to do. And you want to show that continuity. You want to show that, you know, we, we have to transition from one phase to another, and that involves additional funding. It involves, for example, attending an event and presenting the work we're doing and 
trying to convince others that our technical solution is the one that should be adopted and so on. So there's, um, there's really a significant aspect to that transition from one, one phase to another. Um, so one of the very interesting uh, uh, um, oops, um, discussion aspects is, you know, how do we set up an OSPO? How do we organize it under a given company? So the next few slides are pretty much like circles and squares. So it's like just back to kindergarten and, and, and different colors. Um, so uh, my first slide is, if, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, are the slides available somewhere? Yeah, so... Uh, I, yeah, so I, um, I will make them available from my, on my LinkedIn profile. Um, and if, um, if you want access to the actual slide, um, just drop me an email. My, my email was it's my first name at Linux Foundation, and I'm more than happy to share it. Um, so, so one of the first slides I have is if you don't have one, um, it's time to establish, right? I mean, this is easy. Um, but I think uh, there are multiple variations of how uh, OSPOs are set up, and it depends on a company by company basis. Uh, so some, co and I have different models here, and um, I call this like corporate, uh, um, um, ca corporate level, where typically a lot of the OSPOs are folded under the CTO office, right? So what I did for the next few slides is I was looking with a lot of the companies that I work with, and I see how they structure their OSPO. Where does it sit? Is it in research? Is it under CTO office? Uh, is it an independent office under you know whatever function engineering? And I try to kind of model these in, in here. Uh, and actually, there's a, a good lessons to learn after we view all of this. So there's I, I will not spend any time on this really. Uh, they can be under CTO. They can be. This was one of my roles. I was head of research. I was responsible for our internal R&D, but I also I, I owned the OSPO function, right? And I had multiple areas of. Um, um, you know, uh, of uh, technology that I was responsible for in open source. Uh, there are different setups under, under engineering, um, you know. Uh, so I think the whole idea behind these different setups is that, um, and, and yes, there, there's a virtual OSPO, right? So a lot of companies don't have the luxury to have dedicated resources. So they have different people in different units, uh, you know, in marketing and in, in legal and in engineering kind of uh, working together to fulfill kind of the basic functions without having kind of an official um, thing called op or office called uh, open source program office. And I think that whole thing is just to say that um, there's n not a single way to do this, right? Uh, you can structure uh, an OSPO any way you want. What's really important is just to get started. Um, and what I guarantee to you is that year over year, that structure will change. Uh, I've been in OSPOs that were um, you know, a handful of people, like five, six people that grew to a couple hundred people and over time they're back down to five people. And I think there's a very important life cycle there, which is, uh, yeah. So the life cycle is um, a lot of companies, especially, and I talked a little bit about older companies, right, that were created pre-open source and so on. So a lot of these companies, they create a, an open source program office and they start staffing people and then they realize, you know, we need to bring in open source expertise. So they start hiring key developers in projects that they care about. And these key developers would give them kind of immediate credibility in the different uh, communities. But most importantly, they act as mentors for the internal developers to help them figure out how things work and review patches before they submit it and so on. And over time, the goal is to build up that competence, but then once everybody is a few years down the road, right? Once a lot of the engineers are aware of the policies, it's kind of part of the culture. Uh, a lot of the new hires are coming in with open source experience. You don't need to have dedicated engineering for open source. So when you look like at um, very established companies in open source like Google or, or Meta or IBM, you know, they are open source companies. All of, the, all of their developers touch open source one way or another. They don't have kind of a dedicated engineering team just doing this or just doing that. They're spread out. And I've worked in companies like HP where we had uh, a corporate level uh, open source office that does everything for the whole company. Then they transitioned into a business division open source office with very little presence. On, and, and then the head of open source at that point moved to the LF, right? And then now there is none. Why? Because like it is part of how the company works. It is kind of a de facto thing that everybody knows how to work with open source. Everybody 
you know, is familiar with the policies. There's just a couple of people just keeping things in maintenance mode, just keeping things updated. But beyond that, there isn't. So there's this kind of, you know, let's create an OSPO to fulfill the function, to create uh, a presence for the company, to build up the culture, create engineering force, focus on open source. But then once everything is done, like you kind of canceled your existence and then you go into a different uh, uh, form. By the way, this is my own hypothesis. It's not like an Linux Foundation thing. So, so if if you disagree, it you're actually disagreeing with me, and that was my employer. So, and actually, I, I wanted to, to, to write um, kind of a short paper on this, kind of to, to just to trigger a discussion because I see this a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm intending to work on this uh, towards the end of the year, where I take use cases of different companies that went from having no support to having small OSPO, then that OSPO grew up to hundreds of people and they went through the downgrading and now they're like a couple of people. Uh, and you can see it in several organizations. Um, for example, the Microsoft uh, open source program office is like 12 or 13 people. And then, you know, I was visiting their campus because I used to live in Seattle and somebody pointed to me like, you see these two buildings that we've got like hundreds of Kubernetes develop developers in there, hundreds, right? And this is just one major component. So they have thousands of developers working in open source and their whole open source office is just like 10, 12 people. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of staffing, um, there are a given kind of minimal set of people that has to be kind of present in that, in that office. Uh, so I will just, I will not go into specific details. Just obviously you need to have the head of, uh, of the office supported by a software architect who's got a really good understanding of the core products that the company is working on and trying to correlate that with, you know, what's going on with open source and what open source component can we create and bring into the uh, company in support of building these different products and services in the company. Um, by the way, there's, as part of the compliance book I uh, mentioned earlier, there are very detailed job descriptions uh, to a point where actually companies actually go and grab that and modify it a little bit and use it as actual job posting, uh, job posting. So you, you can rely on, on, on these descriptions. Uh, there's usually a technical evangelist, um, you know, not kind of a pure evangelist, but somebody with a deep uh, technical background that is able to go to events, create demos, uh, participate in technical discussions and pretty much promote the contributions of the company and understand how these contributions fit uh, the products and also how they fit in the open source project and try to lobby other organizations to, uh, to use and participate. Uh, there's typically um, some form of compliance expert on the OSPO. Uh, it really depends on the company by company basis because some companies, they have their compliance function at a corporate level and part of that m big compliance uh, office, there's a subset focused on open source license compliance. But in many cases, there's somebody who's got a deep understanding of the open source compliance aspects that assist uh, in that. And certainly there has to be legal counsel, not necessarily dedicated to the OSPO, but available uh, to help with all the open source legal uh, matters. So these are kind of the five uh, core, uh, four or five core, um, uh, core roles. Um, I've used these roles in previous OSPO that I created and managed. And uh, there's another aspect that I didn't mention here, but developers. Uh, so in some of the OSPOs where I was working, we've had a bunch of developers that we hired to, to focus. And eventually we thought that it's not a good model to, to do uh, and eventually transferred these developers and kind of sprinkled, sprinkled them across the, the different engineering team to, to help kind of spread the culture and the awareness and, and kind of the best practice on how to work with open source. And it actually, it is a model that worked really well. Uh, so I will skip. Um, Oh, this is OSPO, okay. Um, so uh, in terms of primary responsibility for, uh, responsibilities of an OSPO, there's a lot of them, as you can see on the, uh, on, on the slide. And this is kind of a more expanded view of the early um, slide we saw where responsible for you know, using and complying and contributing to open source. This is kind of a, a deeper view of uh, these three different categories. Um, working with open source foundation, tracking metrics, uh, implementing inner sourcing, creating guidelines. So there's like a whole bunch of stuff. And the more you drill into it, the more you realize, like if you don't have an open source office and you look at this, like, oh my God, we need to have one right away, right? There's so much stuff that you can actually do. Um, um, and uh, 
again, you know, going back to uh, the to do group, um, this is, um, you know, why why your you know companies with OSPOs are actually more active in open source and I mean it, it it's kind of logical thinking but it's actually also proven uh, in in the OSPO uh, survey as well uh, so the the more companies have OSPOs the more they're involved the more they have formal activities the more they're visible the more they have influence in the projects so the challenges uh, a lot of challenges uh, there are five key challenges okay and if you work for an hospital today i guarantee and i'm kind of willing to bet money on this that uh, actually i would bet my drink vouchers that that you've uh, you you've come across several of these okay um, and what's really interesting about this specific slide is i carry the slide for like the past 10 years and when i go to presentations i've done 10 years ago it was like two or three items in each one of them. And over time, it kind of built up uh, to have more challenges as my, the experiences kind of grew. Uh, so you will have cultural uh, related challenges, uh, challenges with respect to the actual operation of the program, uh, challenges with respect to tools that you need to use uh, internally, uh, continuity challenges. And this is actually uh, one of the most impactful. Um, and I have a very funny story, a true story as well. So I worked in a company where every year they do executive rotation. So I was a VP reporting to the country uh, CEO. And every year I have a different CEO. And every year I have to, in January, go to the new CEO. My name is Ibrahim Haddad. I'm the VP of this. You know, basically starting fresh. And, and it was so hard in terms of fundraising because every CEO has different priorities. And, and every CEO have different um, um, kind of challenges they want to they want to do for the company achieve for the company uh, and they may not care about open source security but they care about open source cloud then what do i do with my open source security activities that's like two million dollars i need to fund right so uh, the continuity of strategy the continuity of funding the executive support the continuity of that are extremely critical um, and you probably experienced uh, times where executive change and then you got an email and then you have to figure out what to do with people Right. Okay. I have like 10 engineers working on um, uh, a certain uh, a graphic library, and now this is not a priority anymore. What do I do with them? So one of the things I actually did uh, for my team, we adopted uh, kind of quoting what the, the the model that Google created, which is like the 80 20 percent. So we've had this thing where. Um, um, we didn't come up with it again. The 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 credit goes to Google. We just adopted it. Is uh, across you know throughout the year we have um, at the beginning of the year developers decide you know I'm a graphics developer. I'm a current developer. I'm whatever developer in, in the area they are in, and they choose an area they want to expand their expertise in. So for that. And these areas are predefined by us as management, you know, my core team and myself, where we try to see where, where are we looking at next year? What's going to be hot for this given com for our company in a year or two? And we try to build up that knowledge through the 20%. Uh, so we're not doing any critical work. It's just basically take that time, you know, five, six, seven hours a week to learn as a developer. And because we want you to be ready in a year that if we shift priorities, you're, you're already kind of in, in, in that environment. Uh, so that helps us uh, quite a bit. Uh, so all these different challenges, and certainly there's the education bit, uh, which, is, uh, which goes in multiple ways. Oops, here we go. So the education uh, piece is um, actually one of the core challenges, uh, because in, in many times you're kind of educating your, your, your superiors. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, as uh, as vice president of open source or vice president of R&D, you're working with CEOs or you know SVPs or EVPs who don't necessarily have the background in open source, don't have that knowledge. Um, so, um, so uh, there's kind of executive education. You know, you're kind of educating uh, above you. You're educating your peers. You're educating your staff. Uh, and in many cases, um, as an OSPO, we've done a lot of. Uh, formal training we actually created uh training courses and recorded a lot of them and it became kind of mandatory for our teams 
and anybody touching open source. Uh, so we've, we've done a lot of that. And actually, uh, for instance, one of the things that I really like that we, we've done, and uh, I would highly recommend doing it in your organization, is kind of a new hire orientation. Right? On the first day when you have new hires, they typically get like, the brainwashing company stuff. And we've added like four or five slides on open source. OK, here's what we do with open source. To use open source, go, th go to that web link. To, to contribute, do that. Here's the link, right? So from day one, they know that you know uh, we as a company we're heavily involved. We do, you know, we have policies that they have to follow, and they would know who to follow up with. So we've done a lot of work in these areas. Uh, so it is actually overwhelming, and I guarantee that anyone here working in OSPOS would experience most of these, if not all of them. Uh, and I think the good news is there's a way to address each one of these, right? Um, and, and the advantage we have today is that we have, we can look back at all these companies that came before us and experience these challenges and learn from them. Uh, and there's actually the To Do Group, which is kind of a collection of I don't know 150 companies um, that have uh, OSPOs that come together, share best practices, um, share how they address these different challenges. They share tooling that they've developed to address different things that they come up with and, and so on. Uh, so if, if you're in, in, in an OSPO, and I would certainly recommend um, becoming part of the to-do group, there, is, there are no fees or anything of that sort. It's just like free, uh, uh, free effort under the LF that you can join. They meet regularly. They have different geographical... Um, um, I, I know I'm on the uh, Europe and Middle East call, so I show up to that call. And, you know, so there's uh, efforts in, in specific to Japan, in Europe, in the U.S., uh, in support of different uh, geographies. Sorry, you had a question? Because no. you were waving your hand. Okay, sorry. Anna has to find out, so Anna has to sit in. Okay, awesome. So, the, uh, so you can go to this guy. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm not sponsored by the to-do group. I'm just, um, and there are a lot of factors that influence the success of OSPOS. And this is actually, uh, I went back to my Twitter feed from many years ago, and I grabbed this from there. Um, this was actually a poster I created myself uh, when I, I was trying to recruit uh, open source developers. And I was telling them, you know, uh, if you work with us, you have the ability to work remotely. Uh, this was like, uh, I would say, 12 or 13 years ago. I mean, now working remotely is different, especially after COVID, but before it was like not that really, uh, not that popular. Uh, so you can work on uh, remotely, you, uh, you are guaranteed time for upstream development. So if you are as an organization, you want to hire open source developers, you cannot just hire them and put them on something completely different. I mean, they, there has to be continuity for their work in the open source community, and there has to be a certain respect and time allocated so that they continue with their open source duty, which is why you're hiring them. So there has to be time allocated and, and an understanding that this person we hired who's uh, a maintainer or a committer in, I don't know, WebKit, they need to have a few hours a week dedicated to continuing their their role as a maintainer. So we cannot just force down a lot of different uh, work that they would be in a position where they have to choose this or that. Uh, freedom to work outside of the control of product team. Uh, this is very important, right? Because I, I, I worked in, in, in places where um, the OSPO was uh, put up under like a um, uh, head of engineering or you know SVP of engineering, and over time we became just a development arm for the product, and then we lost uh, autonomy and we lost freedom in the areas we should focus on. We become just the the open source team that knows the components included in the product, and then we become kind of an extension to that group. So um, so in, in future teams that I set up and I run for years. Uh, I, I, w I always made sure that I don't have a high dependency on any given product team from a funding perspective. So I always had um, the kind of criteria that any type of open source development that my team does has to at least uh, benefit or be funded by at least two different product teams. Right? So I always have kind of a way, some flexibility in, in, in my operation. Um, so we provided clear guidance on priorities in specific projects. So it's not like hiring somebody and tell them, okay, go do whatever you want. There's always kind of clear line between 
what needs to be done in the open source project and how that's going to help us in the product. Uh, opportunities to be visible at open source conferences and actually that was one of the major uh, things I actually negotiated as part of my recruitment into that specific company where you know, we need to have a budget for um, the team members that join so that they're able to fly to different events, they're able to meet their, their peers, they're able to uh, share the work they're doing, you know, lobby for technical solutions and, and this and that. Um, and that was actually a very successful experience because we had a separate budget than our headcount. So we had uh, around 250K per year, and that was just travel for events. And we would spread that at the beginning of the year, we figured out who wants to go where and kind of spread that. And that work worked extremely, extremely well because then it created additional motivations for the developers because, you know, if you're presenting at the kernel summit, you know, you got to work your ass off, you know, to get things done so that you get to go on that trip. Uh, and the money is guaranteed and the trip is there, it's just waiting for you to do your work. So it, it was extremely good. Uh, and access to proper open source infrastructure, right? So uh, as I, I mentioned, my own experience getting a Windows laptop and no VPN access, no IMAP access, it was a nightmare. I couldn't access anything. Uh, so then uh, in, in one of the companies, um, it was so frustrating to a point where we actually created our own infrastructure on, on, on AWS. So we had our own email addresses, uh, you know, Ibrahim at, I'm not going to say the name of the company, but we had like open source OSG dot whatever the, the company name. So we had our own email infrastructure. We had our own VPN. We had our own wiki because we needed to exchange a lot of data files, like in the hundreds of megabytes, uh, especially on the graphics side. And we couldn't do that internally. It was like a nightmare. So, uh, and what was really interesting is per headcount, our cost towards AWS was about $30 per month per person, while I was paying out of my budget around $600 for our internal IT for infrastructure that we're not using, right? So, uh, and, and this is actually common. Now it's a little bit better, but th this is actually common across multiple companies. So we ended up spending, you know, I don't know, thousand bucks per month on, on an infrastructure that serves us extremely well, which is less than the cost of two headcounts paying for IT really uh, to, to do that. Uh, so all of these factors actually influence in the, the success of bringing in resources into your OSPO and maintaining them uh, longer term. Um, There has to be a trick to, for this. But. Um, okay, so recommendations for making an impact as an OSPO. Uh, identify your reliance on open source software. I mean, you need to start from somewhere. And the first step is try to understand where are you using open source software, in which product, and what is you, how far are you dependent on it. And I think this is actually an extremely important step because it will define everything you do from that point on. Um, and a lot of companies, I, I mean, I read a lot of reports produced by the um, uh, companies that produce SCA tools, you know, the, the, the tools that help you scan code and identify what open source software you're using. And a lot of them include this staggering statistics of you know, companies not knowing they use these hundreds of open source components or not knowing that they rely on 40% of their code is open source and so on. So there's actually uh, a lot of um, open source is so ambiguous. A lot of companies actually use it at the developer level, but when they do their due diligence and they do their scanning for their code bases, they actually discover a lot more code used than actually declared. So your starting point is, I think, uh, and this is from my personal experience is identify what open source you're using and where and how critical it is to you and how dependent you are on it, right? And that will give you kind of a, start, a good starting point to decide what, how to prioritize uh, whatever effort you're doing. Um, yeah, so I think for the next few slides, uh, and I'm really towards the end here, is um, all these infographics are from a report on, uh, that was published by the um, Linux Foundation Research on how organization can have uh, m more impact through their open source development. So I just grabbed these different infographics and I dropped them here. So you'll be able to access all of them. Uh, so set up uh, your organization to implement uh, open source uh, infrastructure 
for compliance, consumption, and contribution. Uh, this is critical, and you know this scary slide with like 50 boxes. This is like your starting point, and you can use it as a way to benchmark what's been already implemented in your company, where you need to do some more work. So that's kind of a great worksheet uh, for people uh, to figure out where improvements are required. Um, be patient and seek influence. Like a lot of companies want to get things done right away, right? Uh, and, and this is like um, a lot of hard work over a long period of time. Uh, to bring in a developer who occasionally contributes to an open source project and get them to become kind of a trusted committer or even a maintainer, we're talking years. Uh, so c companies need to be very understanding of you know, how that process works and it's a, an exercise of building trust and continuing to contribute and um, not just code, but contribute to the technical discussion and the direction of the project. Uh, so it's, um, um, you know, this is actually a very good illustration where you're, you have the water and you're kind of watering a plant and it takes a while, you know, you put, a, you put in seeds and it takes weeks before that seed becomes a little plant and grows and it's a very similar process. Um, practice and encourage uh, an open and cooperative mindset. Um, um, a lot of companies uh, have competing teams, competing groups. And I worked in a company where it was a known fact that they actually established two of everything because they want to create that environment uh, of competition and eventually one of the teams will get there and then you know we're on the path of getting wherever we want to get. Uh, so uh, to be successful really in open source, you need to practice these practices internally and be successful because if you're not able to collaborate with the people you work with in your office or in your company, it's going to be a much harder exercise to do that with outside people, especially that some of them are actually your competitors, right? So there has to be, uh, people have to be in a, in a certain mindset that, you know, I'm here um, to collaborate. I want to solve a problem. It's a big problem that I cannot solve on my own. And hence, I need to go and find um, likely-minded people with the same challenge that want to solve it as well. They're open to collaborate with me. We have to be patient, understand each other. You know, there's that, that whole mindset that has to be there. Uh, we talked a little bit about the IT infrastructure. Uh, it might be less of a problem now in, in most organizations. However, this was kind of a real pain for the past like 20 years. Um, a lot of companies actually suffered from it. And at one point, I, in one of the organizations, I even had uh, two laptops, one that is like the corporate issued one and my own that is like the vanilla whatever Ubuntu or whatnot, and um, move around carrying two laptops. Uh, but basically, th this is actually um, uh, a very important aspect because we, we need to make sure that developers have access to the tooling and infrastructure uh, they, they need access to to be able to do their job, right? So uh, track success through metrics uh, that are designed with an open source environment. So. Uh, um, so, so I gave uh, an early example about a metric that was kind of tracking the line of code that developers do. Uh, so another one was, uh, so on my team, I had a developer, well, uh, I was responsible for multiple technology areas like cloud security, uh, graphics, uh, operating system and libraries and so on. And for each of these different uh, areas, I had one person uh, do kind of uh, janitor work on on all of these different projects. And this is basically going and uh, they call it an open source, like carrying wood and giving water or whatever, just like low hanging fruits. Just go to the code base and see what are the easiest things to fix and spend time fixing it, okay? So that person at the end of the year had submitted like 600 patches which is like incredible, but these are like super easy stuff. Like we're talking like 30 minutes, 40 minutes per patch to, you know, and, and plus the associated time work to, to get it up. Uh, but then you have like the more serious senior developer, they probably have done like 100 patches. And out of the 100, there's like 20 that are super critical that took the majority of, the, of, their, work, of their work throughout the year, right? So then, if the metric is the number of patches, the janitor, the code janitor, which is the person that, that, that does the easy low hanging stuff, should guess like the price, right? But in, in terms of criticality and, and functionality, it's the other way around. So kind of putting the right metrics in place is extremely important because it, it will help drive the, the, the right behavior. 
um, follow a lightweight and tailored approach to uh, contribution approval. Um, so in what that means is um, it's very hard to get contributions out from the company if you have a very complex approval path. Uh, so for example, if you are an engineer, you need to get your manager's approval. The manager has to go to the director. The director needs the CTO approval. Once the CTO approves, it has to go to the patent office. The patent office approves, it goes to the legal counsel, and then you're out. This approach doesn't work, okay? So we figured out a path where, based on the type of contribution you're making, you might have a different approval path. Because the whole idea of the OSPO is to facilitate the use, the consumption, the contribution, and so on. So I'll give you an example. If it is a simple fix, basic functionality, just the engineering manager needs to approve. Easy. You issue a ticket in JIRA or whatever internal system, you say, I want to approve, I, I want to get approval to contribute this functionality, and you choose the type of functionality. Let's say, small fix, just kind of for discussion purposes, right? And then it goes, the ticket goes to the engineering manager and most likely they will reply to it within an hour or two, right? If it's a major functionality, it goes to the, let's say the, the engineering manager and the director. If it is internal code that we're planning to open source, then it becomes a different story. Then it might go to the legal counsel, right? So there are a lot of uh, ways that you can structure the approval path. So to make it super easy and less bureaucratic to get code out without having to need you know, six, seven different approvals for every single patch. And one of the things I've done in, in, in my teams uh, uh, in different organizations was get a blanket approval for all developers working exclusively on open source. So at the beginning of the year, I know these 10 individuals are working 100% on the Linux kernel. I give them approval for the full year and we're done, just go. Otherwise, your legal counsel or whoever overseeing compliance or whatever, they will get hundreds of tickets every day, and that's unmanageable. Yeah. I was just going to, I mean, maybe your last bit answered this, but this, how much does this apply to really highly regulated spaces as well? I'm sorry, how much? Uh, if you're working, in, I work in like the financial like yeah. space, and so the idea of um, having more lightweight, lightweight processes uh, for small contributions sounds great but um, also seems to be like counter to um, the, the requirements of like the entire you know, industry and, and history of the organization. So, so I'll give you a parallel. So I'm not very familiar with the finance industry, but I was working in the telecom industry. Okay. So I, I worked for Ericsson for five years. I worked for um, Motorola for two years and all of that on the infrastructure and mobile side. Okay, and uh, the te telecom industry, you know, we thought we were very special. We're like, you know, we're a highly regulated industry. We have to deal with the FCC. We have to deal with this. We have to deal with that. And at the end of the day, it's just software. There's not much to it, right? And I think from, from that specific perspective, um, and again, not knowing the specifics of what you have to deal with in finance, because I don't have that um, vertical experience. I mean, I'm, I come from telecom and infrastructure. Uh, but basically, um, the whole idea is how can we facilitate the use and contribution? Okay, so that model that I presented now, which is kind of expedited approvals uh, based on the type of contribution, you may take that and again, I don't know what your specific uh, internal kind of regulation you work with, and uh, as an example, and try to figure out, okay, well, there's this idea of providing, depending on the criticality or the functionality provided in that contribution, let's figure out a way to minimize the number of approval. Because if it's like benign or like a, a very simple uh, fix or whatever the case is, there's no need to get the attention of five or six people across the chain to get it to approved, and that also delays the approval. Uh, so the whole idea is like we need to keep going, and we need to, to keep going fast. Um, um, but again, I'm, um, you know, I don't know if this addresses your question because I, I don't have the specific. Uh, this is a follow-up. And are, are you talking about people being able to contribute to an open source project from ongoing, or just that specific? It's both. Yeah. Because uh, there are cases. Yeah, exactly. And because there are, and actually, I will give you the background on that model. So I actually created that model maybe like um, 
maybe like 12, 13 years ago. Uh, and I was working in a company and I had a team of six people okay, working on these different stages. Um, and basically, the ticket was going from one of my team member to another. And overnight, I lost everybody due to massive corporate restructuring. And then I create the ticket. The ticket comes to me as, because I'm taking the role of the other person. I review it and I approve it. And then it goes to me because I'm also fulfilling the function of it. <laughs> and it was, actually, I have a slide where I, like, I have like six of my pictures. And it's like going from this guy to this guy. And this guy is the same. Okay. So uh, the whole idea is how can we get the approval as fast as possible? And I'm not talking about skipping any type of due diligence, just in many cases, not all the due diligence need to happen for every single case. So, and you know, when you think of that, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe in security, you may need to do additional uh, export control checks, right? So, so maybe this is something you cannot skip. So that's kind of embedded in every single check you do, in, in every single uh, um, um, approval that you have to do. But there are other things that, you know, there may not be a need to, to, to include the patent lawyer on, on any contribution because if that piece of code was created and intended for contribution to start with, there's no need for that. Uh, you may need to include the patent lawyer only if you have internal code that existed before as a proprietary code and now you're open sourcing it. So there are different use cases. And once you identify these um, major like four or five cases, about 85% of the tickets will be funneled into these. There's always like small, very small percentage of cases that doesn't fit the mold across like these ticket, the, these major categories. And these are dealt on a case by case basis. But it should be... Um, as streamlined as possible. And you know, the finance industry is kind of in this phase where, let's take the telecom industry today. Today you pick up your phone, you make a call. That call today would not happen if there was no open source and, and Linux period, right? So it's same thing for automotive today. You go buy a Range Rover, a BMW, a Toyota, a Nissan, a Jaguar, or all any or Ford or any of these cars, all their infotainment system in the car is actually powered by Linux and, and open source. So, but it took them maybe 10 years to get to that point. So now the finance industry for the past few years has been kind of more active in the space and trying kind of to do and, and, and help their digital transformation through the use of Linux, well, open source in general. Uh, and you, know, you are at that cusp where you're like, okay, now we are at the scaling point. Now we need to scale. How can we do that? you know, the adoption and the contribution at an efficient scale. Because previously, and I, I work with different, you know, institutions, but on the AI side, on, in finance, and, you know, there are different pockets of individuals and teams working open source, but now a lot of these um, banks and, and investment organizations and others, they're actually setting up an OSPO and they're going into that scaling. So you need to figure out a way to maximize um, uh, the efficiencies. And what's really interesting is, uh, uh, th there was uh, a statement from the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley, which is, you know, the, he stated that the largest uh, category of jobs in Morgan Stanley, the number one largest bank in the U.S., is software developer. So they have more software developers in the bank than any other job category. So, you're, you, you know, the scaling issue, I think, is the thing um, you're going to be dealing with. Ah. Uh, sharing information across the region is actually uh, a pain uh, across multiple of the companies I worked with. So, so um, in fact, I worked with one company where I actually had to sign NDA to share information and discuss with other people working in the same company in a different division. Uh, true story. So, and it took weeks. Um, so uh, sharing information is actually critical and, you know, especially if you, you know, I mean, you, be a, you need to be able to use and apply these open source principles internally uh, to be able to really uh, successfully do it with other people, other companies and, and competitors. Um, um, and I think I, I touched on this where you have to contribute st to strategic or strategically to project where, um, you know, we use dozens and hundreds and thousands in some cases of open source projects nobody has enough resources to be focused on all of them. So we need to figure out a way to understand what are the most critical um, uh, projects 
that to rely on and focus our um, efforts um, on these projects. Uh, allocate time to open source developers to meet their upstream responsibilities. I think I touched on that. One of the main factors why open source developers leave their jobs is because they get forced into a situation where they don't have time to continue their open source um, upstream responsibilities. So we need to be respectful of that and make sure that you know if somebody is a maintainer or a committer in a given um, position, and which is why we hire them as an organization, we need to allow them to continue in that function uh, and allow them to have time to do that part of their job. Uh, partner with product team on our theming code. Uh, so as uh, OSPOs are a cost center, and I've lived through this for so many years, um, we rely on funding from product teams. So everything that I do as an OSPO leader in any of the OSPOs I've managed and set up has to match and align with benefit that we're producing for the product team. Otherwise, we become irrelevant very fast and then when the new year comes in, you're in for a new round of funding and then you find yourself with no money. Uh, so anything that these uh, uh, OSPOs have to do in terms of uh, innovation and technology has to align with uh, the specific needs of the products or services teams. Um, yeah, um, not developing uh, open source talent is very critical. Uh, you know, I was in we working with an organization where we had you know two or three thousand developers up to a company where we had you know sixty, seventy thousand uh, developers, um, and no matter how much resources you have, you cannot go and hire all the open source developers out there. So you need to find ways to, um, to improve the open source competency and um, both on the technical side in specific technologies and also on the methodology and compliance and, and other aspects of open source for of your existing engineers. So developing internal training program, developing mentorship program, uh, pairing developers together, sending in developers to events like this one just to kind of increase and use it as a training opportunity so that you're not just able uh, to hire developers but also you need to improve the skills of your existing developer and bring them up to par to become uh, com committers and, and um, influential in the specific projects you're involved in. Uh, partner with product team, I think I, I mentioned that. Um, this might be redundant. Allocate open source developers to meet their upstream responsibilities. And I apologize for the redundancy. This is actually the first time I do this, like an hour and a half. So there might be a slide or two that actually um, um, we, we've been through them in, in different places. Um, or I'm using this wrong, back and forth, same slide. <laughs> you know? so, uh, develop open source talent internally. I think I mentioned uh, that's, uh, this now. Uh, creating mentorship program, this is extremely essential. And we've done this in a couple of companies where every senior developer um, typically is assigned two, three, four different uh, junior developers. And the senior developer has part of the, what they do as part of mentorship is they review all the patches prepared by the junior developer before they actually go and submit them. So that gives them kind of an internal review before they actually go live with it. And that worked extremely well where we're able to assign a few engineers to every senior developer and putting a, a time limit of three, four months, depending, you know, co every company is different on the length of that mentorship. Uh, and ideally when that mentor graduates, then they're able to submit patches without kind of internal supervision. Uh, and today in the Linux Foundation, we even have the uh, LFX mentorship program where individuals are able to nominate themselves to be mentored as part of kind of a larger program that we have. So this is something I, that didn't exist back then, but it exists today. So I would encourage you to look into it. So it's part of, um, if you look up LFX uh, mentorship, so you'll be able to land directly on the homepage of that project. Uh, participate in and host open source event. This is extremely helpful. Uh, I mean, for the first few years in, in my career, I was working for the organizations that uh, recognized the importance of this. And I, uh, you know, I was in my early 20s and I was like hosting events of like 20 people showing up to the office on Saturday, making sure that like the food is served, we have pizza, we have like hats and like stupid things like that. But you know, I mean, it, it brought us closer to the community. It brought us closer to the developer to understand how they think, what's important to them. 
uh, they started to see us in a positive light, and it was kind of really a learning experience. Certainly today, you know, 25 years later, it's a different environment. We have like these professional events and, and so on, but uh, you know, one of the things that I do with a lot of the startup I work with is like, you know, go to figure out what meetups are happening in your city. Are there any meetups like for Python? Um, it's, is, is, are there any meetups focused on, you know, PyTorch? Is this important to you? Offer to host them, you know? I mean, they, there are a lot of things like that that are small but have really big significance and it kind of helps build bridges with the different communities uh, of the projects. Um, so, um, by the way, thank you so much for not leaving yet. This is pretty awesome. Uh, so, uh, mastering open source, like to become really a master in, in any given trade, uh, similar to open source. Uh, in open source specifically, you need to be very good at three things, right? Uh, using open source, complying with the licenses, and contributing. These are really three essential building blocks for any organization to become a very strong company in open source. So when you look at uh, companies like IBM or Google or NVIDIA or uh, Intel or any of these really massive companies that are known for their open source activities, they are extremely, extremely good at all of these three building blocks, right? Uh, so for uh, consumption, there's uh, really a list of recommendations you would do to, um, to, to improve your practices there, similarly to compliance and contribution. Um, and the, there are really three core principles to, uh, to embrace when working with open source. The first one is we cannot hire as any given organization, you cannot go hire all the smart people in the world. I mean, you need to figure out a way to collaborate with smart people in other organization, smart people at universities. You need to collaborate with people that are working for a competitor company. And the way to do that collaboration is under the open source umbrella. So we can do that. Uh, the second principle is uh, open source R&D creates significant values, meaning there's billions of dollars of open source investments that exist today. Uh, you know, hundreds of millions of lines of code. In, in my umbrella at the Linux Foundation, LFA and Data, in the past four years, we've created 23 million lines of code across 54 projects. I mean, this is hundreds of millions of dollars available in AI investment to any company. And the value of your internal R&D is to leverage that. You know, your internal R&D team should be sitting and thinking, you know, there's all these thousands of components, these hundreds of open source AI libraries and tools and framework. How can I use them and benefit from them in building whatever I'm doing for my own organization? And the third principle is, uh, kind of uh, in, in a different sentencing or different word is like the not invented here syndrome. Like you don't need to create a project to benefit from it or to use it. A lot of companies uh, excelled at benefiting from projects that they've never created and they came in late to the party, right? So you can benefit from a project you didn't create, you can participate in the community and become a leader in it, even though you were not the principal author or creator of that specific technology. Um, another, some infographics you can look at later. Uh, so in terms of resources, there's like, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of books. Uh, I also posted them on my website, because if you want to go to the Linux Foundation website, it's actually a pain to, because some of them go back to you like three years ago and you have to scroll and find different pages. But there's really a bunch of uh, resources that are available and there's also free training. You can actually go to the Linux Foundation edX platform uh, a lot of the courses we provide are actually free. Developers or participants need only to pay if they want to take the test and get the formal certificate. But outside of that, you can audit you know, a 20-hour course over the period of like two weeks and study and, and, and get all the knowledge without having to pay anything, right? So there's really a bunch of resources that are available. Uh, and as I mentioned, I will post my slides and um, 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 on, on, my, on my LinkedIn, and if anybody would like to get the actual copy, uh, please send me a note. My email is my first name, Ibrahim at linuxfoundation.org, and I'm more than happy to share it. Uh, so thank you. And